Welcome back and today is TGIF, thank God it's Friday, we are on the 9th of September, 10.30pm, Singapore time which translates to 10.30am Eastern Standard Time. I welcome you on board to join our YouTube channel and I'm really, really excited to be right here with you here in Singapore. I'm back here in Singapore finally. <laughs> now today, before we get started, I want to change the sequence or the format of how we present our YouTube delivery and this is where, you know, if you are watching us from Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn or elsewhere, it's okay. You can go to participate together with us on our live stream chat and I can see many of you jumping on board right now on the live stream. Okay, this is how we're going to do the sequence. Every day, you know, there are many, many different news out there, especially today, the biggest headline will be Queen Elizabeth. Now, we are going to Make sure that of all the various news that's passing through the various news outlets, we're going to just pick out one. <laughs> How's that? I want to make this uh, channel much, much more productive and be very, very succinct and be very, very selective on what we're going to cover for the topic of the day. So, you know, you're going to look at so many different news channels, read so many news articles across social media, mainstream media, and so on. But I'll just pick out one, and that will be the main topic that we're going to share right here for tonight's uh, presentation. All right? So step one, I will pick out one news item. And step two, right after I go through the main delivery of the topic, I will go on to pay my greetings to those of you who just joined us, recently joined us or who have been religiously following us every single day on our live streaming. Thank you. We're going to have a conversation together with you. And finally, step three, we're going to conclude the message of the day. All right. So I want to keep this sequence really in a logical, clean manner so that our time is really productively spent each day uh, delivering this live stream to you. Okay, so here we go. What will be the news, big news topic I'm going to pick for the day is uh, really, really fascinating. I want to switch over my channel right now and uh, make sure you, if you have a exact kit together with what I selected, uh, that will be really, really great and thereby kind of uh, give you an incentive or challenge to think about, hey, teacher will be speaking about which particular topic news topic of the day, all right? So if there's a match match, wow, we are getting really close. Great minds think alike, okay? So I'm going to right now get ready to switch over the screen and kind of uh, manage to handle all the technical glitch. <laughs> I found a bug finally uh, early this morning together uh, with my good friend uh, Fabian and we managed to solve the problem, all right? So here we go. A big topic that I want to cover for today here we go. How do we use options to bet on volatility for these stocks with upcoming analyst days? Goldman says. This is a big, big topic. Uh, as you know, options is a very, very big market. And, you know, I started off my training right at the Chicago Board Option Exchange. Uh, that's where I fell in love with the world of uh, trading and investing. In fact, I started off really with the first eight years of my life truly grounded uh, into the world of options trading. And then the next eight years of my life uh, grounded into the world of stocks investing. 
And that's already taken 16 uh, years of my life. And, you know, the, the, the 16 years of my life, after which uh, the last six years I've been uh, diving my head into the world of cryptocurrency trading and, you know, thereby formulating my thoughts into what I call the Wealth Trilogy. Options, cryptos, as well as stocks. Now, for options market, we basically trade on volatility. Now, this is where you're going to have a big movement. A 10% jump in the stock price typically will result between uh, what I call 5 to 10 times more. Now, 5 to 10 times more, how do we go about calculating this? So 10% stock price movement, 10 times of that will be 100% movement on the options premium. Now, 5 to 10 times means 50 to 100% movement on the options as opposed to a 10% movement on the stocks, all right? So this is a really fascinating piece of article uh, dated 8 of September, 10.51 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So it's still very new, very, very fresh, and indeed extremely relevant to what we're going to cover for today, all right? So here we go. How do we go about taking a piece of news like this, interpreting it, and as well as applying a knowledge on how we're going to execute on a certain position, all right? So here we go. Second quarter earnings season is the rear view mirror, but there's still a busy calendar in the weeks ahead that could give a jolt to some major stocks. Goldman Sachs derivatives research team led by Vissel Vivek said in a note to clients on Thursday that analyst days add significant volatility to stocks and may be even more impactful during bear markets. So a few things to note. Right now, there's this big fight over, are we in a big R, big recession? Are we in a technical bear or real, real bear? Or <laughs> what is the market right now? Now, there are different versions and interpretation of it. Nothing is like cast in stone, the way I, I look at uh, the interpretation. And what is really important is, more importantly or most importantly is, what is your mindset about investing? Right? Does it mean that if everybody say and proclaim to you we are in a recession, means that you, you take, take a step back and say, holy moly, I'm going to step out and step back. I'm not going to touch investing anymore. Is that your interpretation? I, I want to know, what is your step two if everyone at step one is telling you that there is a recession now or we are in a bear market now? or the market is collapsing now, or we are in the what we call the dooms market now? What is your step two? Have you thought about this question? Because if you have not formulated your step two, then why do you keep asking about step one? <laughs> I mean, I'm getting a little bit philosophical here because this is, this is the, the struggle that many people go through. Right, they are so eager to tackle step one. Oh, what is the market now? Are we in a bull market now? Right? Bear market now? Are we in a recession market now? Are we in a collapse market now? Are we in a doomsday market now? And if I were to instinctively give an answer, then I look at them and I say, what's your step two? Now that you heard the answer. Does it mean I tell you bear market now, you're going to step out? You're not going to trade for the rest of your life until the market is green, green, green? Or what does it mean to you, all right? So I want to encourage you all to start thinking and asking great questions because if we can start keep keeping our mind clean and having clarity of what are the steps, step one, two, three, so if we know step one sequentially, step two, how we should react, that will propel us to step three, what is the final outcome, then really there's not much struggle for us to go through, right? So... Let me go back to the core of how we started this YouTube live streaming. <laughs> I, I want to go back to the core core of things so that we are all on the same page and, and uh, really uh, we are really guided by a commonsensical approach to investing so that you know we, we don't get distracted. Our mind late, uh, you know, got distracted to the dark side and every now and then we are just broken down and, and kind of a crumble. So my answer to you is this. Regardless of step one, whether we are bull, 
bad or neutral. Our step two is a consistently, yes, we're going to keep going into market to acquire wisdom. We're going to continuously look for opportunities to trade or to invest because this is keeping pulse with the market. We are reading the pulse of the market. We are building up our intuition, our sixth sense. And most importantly, we are upgrading, upgrading our software in our brain to connect the dots, which we call analysis. That's what we call our step two. All right? So be, be aware of how you frame your questions or you ask your questions because you will trick your mind into depression. <laughs> <laughs> and really, I think I'm, I'm tackling depression here. You know, and, uh, when I was in Harvard Business School, I mean, it's a very, very recent event. Uh, one of the topics that uh, I've not really dealt with really openly on an open channel like this on YouTube is this. This year round for, us, for my second year at Harvard Business School, to my holy moly discovery, I found out that, wow, I think over 50% of the participants, they are coming from the backgrounds of uh, running family businesses. That means they are either second generation, third generation, or even fourth and fifth generation of a strong lineage line of a powerful family name. And in fact, you know, one of the guys seated next to me in the first week, he was the fourth generation, holy moly, the fourth generation, the largest milk supplier in India. And I look at him, oh my gosh, this guy looks like a millennial, you know, he's so, so young, so muscular, so attentive, and uh, so enthusiastic. And I look at him, I say, by the way, uh, what is your business? Fourth generation business. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, I got kind of a big takeaway from that. I know this is a little bit uh, digress uh, <laughs> from we want to cover on options trading, <laughs> but I hope you guys are enjoying. And at any point in time, you know, if you guys have uh, feedback, uh, just feel free to <laughs> to to to, to uh, go to the live stream chat and uh, let me know. Right. So I I hope that. Uh, I don't distract you from the core teaching itself, all right? So uh, let me come back to the family business and, and I want to make a conclusion about it. I'll be diving deeper into this topic of family business when I meet up with my students in uh, next week, a uh, cozy live trading event, all right? So this is where I can share much more deeper insights uh, outside the pur purview of the public eyes, but within the close protection shield <laughs> in, among my students' community, all right? So I'm, I'm just reminding myself I'm right now speaking in the public domain. Okay, what is the thing about family businesses and kind of uh, I got a major breakthrough out of it? One thing, in fact, there are three things I walk away from uh, this year round uh, at Harvard Business School surrounding the topic of family businesses, all right? Number one, I will never, never, never allow my children to step into my line of business. I will never want them to do that because I want them to carve out a niche for themselves, uh, a world of their own where they can be very happy doing the things that they love to do. And, you know, I got three boys and... And each one of them are, are really growing up to, be, to, to become a different man of their own. One of them is going to be a, like a rock star, singer, dancer. <laughs> one of them is going to be the poly, probably one of the tallest, tallest man or tallest boy or, or adult in Singapore. Uh, he's growing so fast at the rate uh, of his age right now. And the other one is a really, really happy, uh, down-to-earth Christian boy and just really uh, so proud of him, all right? So I'm not going to tell you who is who, and, <laughs> and this is, this is the, the thing among the siblings. Now, I walk away from number one, I don't want my children to continue in whatever businesses I have. I want them to carve a niche for themselves. That's number one. Why? Because I think I want them to pursue happiness. And I observed in the case studies, we did quite a number of case studies, I think at least about uh, six to seven case studies uh, this year around at Harvard Business School, 
on family businesses. How family businesses broken up and siblings rivalry. Uh, and the worst that that's really close to home is today I open up the newspaper and uh, I saw this uh, very sad news. All right. So let me just open up this and uh, kind of quickly show you. Uh, this is closer more to home because uh, I kind of know one of the siblings in this particular story. Here we go. Ex-president, which is the, referring to the Singapore president, Ong Ting Chong Sons. Uh, hang on, let me just close off that. Ex-president Ong Ting Chong Sons took former sister-in-law to court after much deliberation, heartache, lawyer says. All right? This is a big fight uh, between Ong Zibun and... Um, What's the other guy's name? I can't remember. Uh, uh, Ong Ziguan and Ong Zibun, right? So I happen to know one of the brothers. And anything that's a fight between siblings is always a very, very ugly sight. Now, this happens to Singapore's former president, Ong Ting Chong. And you also get to read about the Singapore very famous founding father, Lee Kuan Yew, and his children fighting it out in the... Not just in the open courts. I don't think they went to court. They went all the way out to Parliament, where it's such a such a ugly end. I don't think there's a, even an end to begin with. All right. So, this is the part that it, it pains pains a lot just to read stories like this, and that's the reason why number one, my takeaway is I don't want them to get involved in my business. I want them to pursue or open up their own path. Second big takeaway is this. The moment you have a business to pass on to your children, and in fact, this was shared by uh, one of my classmates at Harvard Business School. He's uh, second generation, right? And he openly to, to, uh, shared with us that there's only two outcomes. <laughs> For the one stepping into the shadow of the parents or the grandparents, two outcomes. Number one, Either you become very, very conservative, you don't do much. Because the family is very so rich, right? You don't do much. Uh, the money is well managed by uh, managers or, or corporate executives or by bankers. Every year, they just make another 5 to 10% more. They are still super wealthy. So most of them would not want to destroy the family wealth. And for fear, they destroy the family legacy. And they become a scary cat. They don't do much. They just want to preserve the wealth. All right. So outcome number one. Or outcome number two, they try to do even much more than their forefathers. And they say, I want to overshadow my ancestors. That's where they take on much bigger risks. And this is the part that, you know, friction starts to uh, break up the family. Uh, so this is like play out in Bollywood, in Hollywood, in whatever wood that you call it. Very, very common, all right? So that's my second takeaway. And the third most important takeaway, I believe, is this. When you pass on a family business, it always uh, dawns on the successor uh, what exactly the successor wants to pursue becomes secondary rather than to continue the tradition. And... And kind of my interaction with, with my classmates, those who take on their family businesses, uh, you know, there's always a certain angst in their voice, in their sharing, when they talk about their family businesses. First, they have to pay, pay a lot of respects to their, to, to their father or to their grandfather and all that. But the things that they truly want to do has been thumbed down, all right? They are not given full authority. They are just a corporate to me, a corporate manager appointed by the father or by the grandfather. So they have to stay many, many years under this uh, shadow of the bigger forces above them. And I do not know what is the, what's the outcome of staying under that shadow for many, many years. Does it make the person a better man or a weaker man? I do not know. Some may turn out to be a stronger man or a greater man, right? But I think majority, when you have been thumbed down or been cast in shadow for a long duration of time, and suddenly you allow the guy to have full freedom, 
I don't think it's that simple. All right? Seriously. So why I delve into this topic? Because the most common question coming from my classmates, especially those from family businesses, they always like to ask me first thing in the morning, Clement, what's the market today? <laughs> And after some time, the first one or two time, I happily responded. The third and fourth time I was, I look back at them. So what if I tell you? What's your step two? And then they go, ooh. <laughs> and that's how we arrive at this discussion today. So what if I tell you there's a recession or there's a bear market? What is your step two? I want to know. And, you know, they, they don't even know how to react. And I take this into the context of where we are today, we bring back to the topic right now. So when you read a topic like during bear market, during recession market, during doom market, doesn't matter. What matters most is what is your step two regardless of the market direction. All right. So this is what I want to cover on these two keywords called bear markets. All right, we continue. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> spend quite some time just on the two words bear market, all right? And let's continue with the remaining parts and then we delve into the individual stocks. Analyst days have historically been an important catalyst for stocks and especially so in periods of macro uncertainty. Our analysis shows the average stock across our study move plus minus 2.3% on analyst days between 2004 to 2022 year to date, this increased to 4% in 2008 and is 3.6% in 2022 year to date, the note said. All right, and we continue, press on. Okay, I don't review the, to you the companies yet. And we finished off this paragraph. Goldman, Goldman's research shows that buying straddles around analyst days have returned above 6% on average since 2004 and 8% this year. A straddle is an option strategy that includes buying a call and a put with the same expiration and strike price. When a strike price is at the money or equal to current stock price, the straddle serves as a bet on volatility in either direction. All right? So let me address the topic of straddle and then we dive into the individual stocks. So in the world of options, I call it the three S's, alphabet S, all right? We have spreads, straddle, and strangle. And then from the three S's, we branch out to cover call, iron condo, butterfly, and all in, there are about 56 different options trading strategies. Now, in the beginning, I was just fascinated. Oh my God, I mean, you can play 56 different ways in the options market. So amazing, right? Until I challenge you, play each of the strategy with real money, real emotions attached, then you realize that, eh, why make it so complicated? <laughs> why, why do you even have 56 different strategies when the analysis of a single stock is, should be taking up the majority bulk of your time and your resource to conclude which company to bet on? But this is where those hardcore options traders went to the dark side. They just purely focused on options trading and forgot the pure fundamentals of analyzing a real business or a real company, okay? Now, of course, uh, there are different ideology behind this. Some love to trade just on the options premium. But, you know, I entered the trade to acquire wisdom, not for the adrenaline, not for the fun, but really to understand the world of business. So that is my starting point, and I hope to pass on this uh, perhaps you can call it values or passion or, or the ideology or philosophy behind investing. I'd like to pass on to you this uh, thinking behind it, okay? Now, we covered the whole article and before I unveil to you uh, what are the companies that is being mentioned in this piece of news, let me pay our greetings to those of you who just joined us on the YouTube Live as well as Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Wow! <laughs> now, let me switch on my live chat chat and thank you all for your patience uh, with me. You know, the past few days, I've been faced with so many glitches. <laughs> and let me just type in right now. Welcome back! And who is in the house right now? 
you can uh, start chatting away and I can see you on the live live stream. Here we go. All right, who's in the house? Okay, I should wait for your response and I try to connect. Um, another thing I want to demonstrate very, very much is this. Hold on a minute. Um, oops. There we go. Okay. Um, who's in the house today? Wow, let me read out. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a minute. Uh, I need to trace back where I post the message. And okay, I see Isabella. Um, let me just off the music. It's very distracting. Here we go. I pay my greetings to Isabella, Jeanette. Good to see all of you. Elton, uh, Jerrica, Wilson, Emmeline, Ronnie, Benjamin, uh, CK, Kelvin, Gerald, John, Tran, Dizu. Jamie, Paul Green, uh, Thomas, Ryan, Bucky, Angel, Rose, Kinip, and Carol. Wow, so many of you are in the house tonight and you thank you for spending time with me uh, on a Friday night right here in the program, all right? Really, really excited to see all of you here. And of course, you know, this week has been like, I think I'm, I'm kind of a semi-conscious because I didn't realize until one of my friends reminded me that uh, you don't recover that fast from a jet lag. I thought I recovered and that's perhaps, you know, I may think that I recovered, but semi-consciously, I'm still <laughs> still floating in the air somewhere, all right? So I wanted to do quite a number of things and kind of uh, not smooth in the technical execution, but I want to show you this thing right now, right? So here we go. Uh, this is something that uh, I pick up from my... Uh, Harvard Business School from my classmates and kind of uh, exciting for me because this tool itself I realized is so productive it really goes back to the original nature of us loving to write what do I mean by loving to write holy moly right so even if you love to write or you love to draw and I mean you know one of the cartoons that I love to draw uh, back when I was still a, a, a youth <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can remember uh, this particular cartoon, all right? Uh, kind of something like that. And <laughs> kind of a lost touch already. All right, so what I just done is using this tool called Remarkable. It kind of uh, communicate this real feeling of uh, writing and bring back the nostalgia, right? Uh, in in the modern world today, most of us kind of uh, give up, uh, stop writing on an actual piece of paper. We are so used to typing out on a keyboard. And when I was introduced to Remarkable, I mean, I, I kind of first thing, f uh, straight away fell in love with this product. And I said, wow, you mean I can do all this great stuff and I can kind of uh, change my tip to a paintbrush and, and, and you know, take paintbrush is like, I can, uh, for example, I sign off my name here, Clement, and then I can just, you know, apply more pressure on the pen and straight away it, it produces a darker ink. Or I can go back here and change it to uh, what we call um, a highlighter, all right? So let's say uh, a marker, no, not marker, it's a highlighter. And I can highlight kind of uh, the bow tie right there. <laughs> All right. Or highlight the head right there. I mean, up to me, right? So there's many ways of me playing with this tool called a Remarkable. And, you know, this was introduced to me by my classmate. Basically, we can also integrate uh, PDF files into Remarkable and then write over the PDF file itself. So we are doing averagely about uh, three to five case studies per day uh, this year round. And... Uh, quite a number of them were just, you know, importing the PDF file into Remarkable and then straight away formulate their, their reading and their writing on top of the PDF file. And this is how I capture my notes. So, for example, if I come back to here and I go back to, like, I, I kind of uh, cover, want to show you uh, how I, 
I document my notes right now. And you know, um, this is what I covered on the 6th of September. And this is what I covered on the 7th of September. And this was what I covered yesterday on the 8th of uh, September. And of course, finally today, we are on the 9th of September. All right. So this is a very clean way of you uh, storing your data and then keeping it the habit of writing. You must love writing. And I mean, for me, I really love to write Chinese. And, you know, uh, this is the way I write my Chinese name. <laughs> I know you can, can even recognize this or not, all right? So uh, this is what I wanted to demonstrate to you. I think this week, but a few times around, you know, I ran into the technical glitch and didn't show up that well, okay? So with that, let me switch back. And thank you all for joining us here on the live stream. Really, really happy to see all of you. And with that, I want to finally end off with the article and make it productive for our session right here tonight. Okay, so here we go. We covered just now and we arrived at the part where we are talking about which are the candidates that Goldman Sachs, uh, they are actually looking at. Here we go. So we are looking at Starbucks right here. And, you know, there's the column, what we call the analyst days. And this is where you become extremely volatile. And let me just move away my picture. So Starbucks will be 13 of September together with Workday. Uh, 13 will be 10, 11, 12, 13. That will be on Tuesday. But please bear in mind on Tuesday, it's going to be extremely volatile. Because at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on next Tuesday, that will be the discovery of the inflation data, CPI. Uh, you'll be published at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and things will just go haywire everywhere, all right? Depend on are we hitting uh, 7% or 8% or 9%. The previous round was 8.5%, which was a drop from 9.1%, all right? So just bear in mind, next Tuesday is going to be extremely volatile. And then I saw my really favorite company right here, Danaher. This company was featured on year one and when I was at Harvard Business School, all right? It was a Big case study just on Danaher. In fact, on the second year, they were still talking about it, all right? Uh, extremely, extremely powerful company, one of the best run companies to generate free cash flow. And that was what was uh, what was taught to us. And of course, uh, yesterday I spoke about semiconductor chips. Then you have two candidates right here, Qualcomm as well as Intel coming on uh, September 22nd and September 27th and 28th, all right? So those are the highlights and... Those are the ones I will really go in, dive in deep to spend more time to play on the volatility. Now, why this is important to us and what is the logic driving this, all right? So, step one, how do we discover those great stocks just now? There must always be a logical sequence. Step one, remember every day there are many news. In fact, today the biggest news is about the passing of the Queen and the multiple rainbows above Buckingham uh, Palace, right? But I don't want to spend time talking about that. You guys already read it everywhere. And I challenge all of you every day, find the most important piece of news article that will have an influence on your thinking. So I will pick one, you will pick one, and on our YouTube live stream, we come together and see if there's a match. If there's a match, congratulations. Great minds think alike, <laughs> all right? Because I'll always look for the most important one that I can acquire new knowledge and elevate my wisdom. That is my step one. So because of step one, I got attracted to this article about options, volatility on analyst days, about Goldman Sachs and declaring one, two, three, four, five, six different stocks. My step one allowed me to arrive at step two to look at six different stocks, right? So at step two, I'm exposed to them with a trigger date. Remember, we always look for a trigger date. No trigger date, you can't squeeze the stock price, you can't squeeze the profits. Then at step three, out of the six stocks, I have to decide, do I go in one to play one or two or all six of them? Based on a certain method, or based on a certain strategy, I embraced. So for those of you gone, gone through my training, we 
apply a what we call a FIAT methodology, F-I-A-T, which stands for Fundamental Insider Alerts and Technical Analysis, all right? And based on the FIAT method, we will decide out of the six, do we play two or play one or walk away? That is how we complete our three steps of attracting news flow, deciding on which piece of news to read on, and then diving in deep on the individual stocks and to decide finally which is the one that truly we want to fire in the, into the marketplace. All right? So I hope you kind of enjoyed this session because we found six great companies. And of course, you do not know which one I'm playing because um, typically that, the, that one or the particular one I'm playing is reserved for those of you who subscribe to the Don't Stop Believing trade notification, which I will give you the QR code to subscribe later on, right? So let me complete this article right now and then you formulate the complete picture. Here we go. One of the biggest companies on the list is coffee chain Starbucks. The company announced Lexman Narish, Narash Shimhan as his incoming CEO last week. And Barclay said on Wednesday that investors had a buying opportunity for the stock ahead of Starbucks Investor Day on September 13. So you are only left with two windows right now. Today, which is Friday, and next Monday, before the CPI data is released on Tuesday. You do not want to, <laughs> I mean, um, uh, kind of uh, challenging for these two days, especially Friday and Monday, because anything can happen on next Tuesday. Whether inflation did been thumbed down or ran out of control. Now, Wall Street believes that we should hit below 8.5%, but anything could happen. Always keep an open mind, all right? Um, this is what I, I kind of uh, think through. But of course, I have, my, I have my own thesis about the inflation data coming on next Tuesday. I believe inflation is well contained right now, unless there's something missing in uh, the pipeline of data that's coming up, all right? So that's also what Wall Street is, is believing too. They expect inflation to kind of a drop below 8%, all right? So if it's kind of a drop to, if, if it drops to 7.1% or the best case scenario, 6.9%, holy moly, I tell you, we're going to have a bull run straight away, boom. And a few signals to kind of tell us we might have that because uh, let me give you the clue, right? So where's the clue? The clue is always in the Dow Jones Index right here. This is my habit. I always like to come back and check here on the Dow Jones Index. And you can see there's the green spurts right there. So if I draw two parallel lines, starting from the lowest candle to the highest candle, and I pot it out like this, you can begin to see, eh? Looks like there is a behavior right there. And what is this particular behavior? This spot here, and the rest of them who just follow nicely with my uh, original uh, straight line, inclined straight line that I drawn right there, right? So uh, that is the green shoots that we are looking out for. This particular green shoot right there, Tung, this little guy right here, all right? So uh, if inflation is contained below 8%, if we hit 6.9% or 7.1%, I think we're going to have a mama period that goes boom straight away goes up this way, right? So uh, the ideal case would be for it to go back to the previous high right there, down at 34,000, 34,000, and that would be the nice red box uh, everybody expect to, for it to follow, uh, uh, fall back into. And then once that happens, guess what? We are really in line for a V-shaped recovery that goes exactly this way. Here we go. This is what we have been waiting for. Highest point right here to the lowest point right there. And then go back right over here. We're going to see a V-shape, right? The only thing that's creating the anomaly behavior is this little box right there. It's fallen out of the trajectory of what we plan out for a V-shape recovery. But, you know, the green candle give us a little bit of hope. It's going to jump back right in line with the incline. Uh, rebound curve, all right? So, I shared with you my thoughts about that and then with that, we can complete 
you decide whether you want to trade before the CPI data is being published next Tuesday. And continue on right over here. Check this out. Semiconductor stocks have a recent track record of market moving announcement and two of the biggest names in the industry have analyst days later this month, all right? So yesterday we covered two and today we covered another two more and you begin to feel it, hey, you know what's happening here? This is something that will always be in demand forever, forever, ever. It's not going to go off, all right? So we spoke about NVIDIA and AMD. Today we are speaking about Qualcomm and Intel. Uh, but you have to decide which will be the real game changer, all right? In fact, the hidden Trojan horse is actually Taiwan Semiconductor TSMC, and that's another story by, by its own, all right? But let's focus on option volatility. We have Qualcomm, uh, shares down about 30% this year as an auto-focused investor day on September 22, and Qualcomm is also a supplier of chips to Apple. And I spoke about Apple 14, iPhone 14, as well as the iWatch Ultra. Oh my God, I, 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 I'm very, very seduced by the <laughs> iWatch Ultra. I just checked with my wife today. My house alone got three iWatches already. Okay, hold back, hold back. Okay, next is uh, Intel has a two-day event focused on innovation near the end of this month. Shares of Intel down more than 40% year-to-date and hit a fit new 52-week low on Thursday, Thursday, all right? And another beaten-down stock is Workday, which has dropped nearly 40% this year. Tech investors are watching the enterprise software space closely for signs of re a recession hitting corporate America. So Workday, September 13th, Analyst Day could be of broad interest. The bigger the interest, the bigger the volatility, the greater the risk and reward return. All right, so there you go. This is how we pick up the best story of the day to inspire you to acquire more wisdom. And thank you so, so much to all of you who joined me uh, today for the live stream. I hope you have enjoyed yourself and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys again tomorrow. So again, every day before you come to the live stream, we kind of change our format. Let me sum it up right now. Number one, before you enter the live stream, go and pick up the most important news article of the day. They'll give you the wisdom, they'll give you the insight, they'll give you the ideas on what you want to trade for that day. And I will find mine. If there's a match, congratulations. I'll be talking about the entire article for the live stream and then we dive deeper to know the substance of the article. All right? That's number one. Number two, during the live stream, you know, I'll be cross-sharing many ideas just from the article itself. And then we dive into the individual stocks. Now, typically, the article will cover about two, three, five, six different stocks. Now, I will always have a bias towards one or two of them, which I'll trade for the night. So right after tonight's uh, live stream, I'll fire off one trade based on the article just now. All right. But this is reserved only for those who are my subscribers at Don't Stop Believing Trade Notification which I'll show you the QR code, which you can subscribe later on. And number three, just to have a kind of a conversation with all of you on the live stream, and you know, it's really uh, touched my heart very, very much every time I see you guys uh, participating and engaging with me on the live chat. Thank you very, very much, all right? And I'm just getting ready for our next Thursday, Cozy Live Trading. Uh, that's our big event of the... That's our big event every month. I host two of such events and uh, catch up with the students on a five-hour in-depth sharing. All right, so that's that's all for today. Thank you very much. I shall look forward to seeing you guys again tomorrow, same time. Thank you and God bless you. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>